In this episode, you're going to learn how you can successfully make an impact as a service designer in an organization where product-centric thinking is currently the dominating force. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, this is Valeria. We are on the This Is Service Design show and this is episode 135. Hi, I'm Mark Fontaine and welcome back to a new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design, what are the hidden things that make a difference between success and failure, all to help you make a positive impact on people and business. Our guest in this episode is Valeria Adani, who's the head of service design at Frog. And the reason I'm so excited to have Valeria here on the show is that we're going to discuss a topic that I think a lot of service designers have been running into. Because even though most companies these days, if not all of them, are delivering services internally, they still use a product language and product thinking. Working inside this dynamic as a service designer can be challenging and sometimes even frustrating. So when you see an opportunity to do good, it may be hard to make your voice heard. Well, Flaria has a lot of experience working with these types of organizations. And in this episode, she's going to share some tips that are going to help you be more successful. So if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll learn how you can better collaborate with product managers and how you can help product teams to see the value of service design, eventually helping you to deliver better services that are more valuable for customers. If you find topics like this interesting and want to keep on growing as a service design professional, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon because we bring a new video like this every week or so. Now, that's all for the intro. And now let's quickly jump into the conversation with Valeria Adani. Welcome to the show, Valeria. Hi, hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing really good. Excited to have this conversation. Uh, you are just on the verge of having a maternity leave. So I'm really on time, right? Yes, absolutely. Literally three weeks from now. So not too far. These are the last moments for me to really focus on work awesome. and service design before I go into something else. <laughs> yeah, so I'm lucky to have you on this episode. Um, now, you. for the people who don't know who you are, um, maybe you can give a short uh, introduction to who Valeria is or what you do these days. Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Valeria Dani. I'm a head of service design at Frog London. Uh, we recently became Frog. I was at IDN before and just before we were live. Work, uh, sorry, <laughs> Adaptive Lab and I was at live work before. I've been in service design for more than 10 years now. That mm. makes me feel very old. A veteran, a veteran. Yeah, very good. Uh, a lot of experience. So, uh, Valeria, before we dive into the topic of today, let's do a rapid fire question round. I'm going to ask you five questions. Your job is to answer them as quickly as possible. So don't overthink them. Anything that comes to your mind is uh, a valid answer. Uh, let's start with question number one. And that question is, what's always in your fridge? Oh, Parmesan cheese. <laughs> awesome. Which book or books are you reading at this moment? I'm reading a lot of pregnancy books, very mm. boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> also relevant, depending on your context. Uh, which superpower would you like to have? Uh, definitely um, hmm, flying. Mm. Okay, I, that, we're, we're going to change that question because everybody wants to fly. <laughs> the next question was, uh, what did you want to become when you were a kid? I wanted to be a patisserie chef. Mm. So. I wanted to bake cakes. And uh, are you doing that these days as uh, an amateur? No, it's not really, not really. I prefer oh. to eat them. Okay, yeah, same side here. Finally, um, now you just uh, hinted that you are in service design for over a decade, by decade, but do you remember when you got first in touch with service design? Yes, I was doing my thesis uh, for my bachelor in communication design, and uh, I started reading a book by Ezio Manzini back in the days. And suddenly I realized this is what I want to do. That was a life changing moment for me. I can, I can remember the, the layout of the page of the book. What was it? What did you read that uh, you thought, well, this is it? Um, 
he was talking about how we need to involve users and how co-creation and making sure that everybody becomes a designer. Um, it was in the context of public uh, design. I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I don't want to do communication design. I don't want to do graphic design. This is what I want to do. And then we yeah, realized, you know, Polytechnico had a great service design master. So I didn't have to you know, go crazy. I found it just at my doorstep. Mm. So that was definitely one of the best life choices I've made. Awesome. Awesome. Um, now, uh, we're going to talk about a topic today that I think a lot of service designers uh, have bumped into for sure, probably have struggled with uh, also. Um, the way I would summarize it is um, that we as service designers still have to operate in a lot of environments which are very product driven product oriented product language products are everywhere while if we look at our gdp it's actually services that we deliver um so there is a paradox a friction a tension here and in this episode we're going to sort of try to see where that is coming from and maybe give some hints and pointers on how to overcome that did I sort of summarize that? Yes, absolutely. Um, around a year ago, we we had a debate in our service design team in Frog London. Like if we, we usually run fun debates and we divided the team into people that were pro service design and people that were product uh, pro product management. So we did this service design versus product manager um, role. And uh, it just... It's something that, um, you know, we, we live in a service economy and yet we still talk about product teams and product management at all the time. And as practitioners in service design, we live this battle every day. Um, so I think it's a very relevant topic. Uh, I'm not saying I'm at the end of this conversation, we're going to say who is the winner, mm -hmm. but definitely like uh, through my years of experience, I had to find a number of tricks or techniques to make sure that we spoke the same language. So maybe that's one of the first question here is uh, maybe, so what? So what that we as service designers have to deal with products and product people and product language? Well. The use and circulation of product cannot be separated from the use and circulation of services. Um, but the product-centric mindset seems to be uh, the mainstream. Um, and the reality is that product-centric mindset very often creates a lot of isolated islands. Um, so that's a good thing for us. It means that we still have a job. <laughs> uh, but on the other side, it's at the detriment of customers, citizens, patients, and users' experience. So I guess my question is, how can we tra transition from product-centric to service-centric? Or is it a transition? Or is it more about coordination? Is it more about merging the two disciplines uh, or a fruitful collaboration where we can speak the same language and work towards the same outcomes. Yeah. And um, language matters, right? Because language informs decisions, language informs beliefs. Uh, and I don't think we're saying that we should get rid of product language and product thinking. Uh, it's just that it's it's maybe not reflect, reflecting reality in the way it currently is, and therefore it's limiting the good things we can do for organizations yeah. or for people. Um, yeah. 100%. I think uh, I've been going and on on language since I started my career. Uh, I started my career not in a service design environment, in strategy and branding. Then I moved into an IT company where I realized actually working with engineers, I needed to speak their language. And it's the same thing with product, manage, uh, product manager and product people. Language and the accessibility of the language. Um, very often we, we just build walls and we create our own uh, jargon in service design. Um, so there is something about making our language more accessible to product people and the other way around, understanding the language and, and finding that, uh, that common ground. But the reality of things is that products are tangible. Their services are not. 
and uh, products are sexy, beautiful screens, beautiful motions, beautiful uh, KPIs that you can track and measure. And what we deal with as service designer is not tangible. And the management and shareholders love to see screens, love to ship products. They want to scale the thing. Um, but what about when you're like selling, what you're selling is not a product, but is access to food, access to transport, access, access to um, services. And I think we need to get better as service designers to articulate our story and use a language that is more accessible to management and stakeholders. Yeah, so uh, we're already diving into some examples and I think you already gave some good examples. It's it's coming from a heritage, it's coming from uh, a management way of working where it's easy to have uh, things that are easily managed, uh, products, uh, very yeah, concrete, <laughs> tangible. Um, now, <clears throat> my question here would be, do you ha already have some examples where you as a practitioner, as a service design practitioner, encountered this friction, and maybe you can share a story how you, yeah, <laughs> I see you nodding. Like, a hundred times. A hundred times, <laughs> I know. But maybe some uh, iconic yeah. ones that you think would be interesting to share and uh, um, see how you manage to deal with that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think my best story in this context is when I actually transitioned from a pure service design agency that was live work, and I moved into Adaptive Lab, now Idea, now Frog, uh, that is historically a product-focused company. So I joined this amazing team of product designers and product managers that were building a new robotic advice service for a financial sector client. Uh, I joined the project that was already ongoing, and um, I suddenly realized coming from this service design kind of like rainbow and unicorn world where service design was the king, I realized who oh, in this context, I'm, I'm not the queen anymore. Service design is not the king. And um, I was actually managed, like working with a team that was so focused on the digital journey that they almost completely lost sight of everything that was around it. Uh, so the before, before, the onboarding digital journey and the after. And um, for me, it was quite fascinating, actually, to realize how much time, effort, and money was spent on an onboarding journey, a beautiful digital product that, in comparison with the rest of the service, was just like a fraction of the value. Um, so it was a bit of a shock, I have to say, at the beginning, but I did find some ways to make sure that we were you know, zooming out and making sure that the, the overall service was actually taken in consideration. Do you want to hear more about it? Well, yeah, let me, uh, let me ask uh, something to uh, clarify this. And um, when we talk about products, uh, even the people designing digital experiences, digital interfaces, digital touch points, they are, of course, designing services, but the tangible artifacts are so prominent that we speak about products and in this case it was maybe an app or a website where somebody was taking through uh, an onboarding process uh, but it was just focused on one channel one medium and um, a very small part of the journey right that's what yeah. we're and you came in as a service designer and you were thinking well there's more than this one single touch point or two touch points there's more yeah. and how do you explain it to people who only have the craft of uh, working in a digital medium or a digital channel who only know how to do that? Well, first of all, for me, it was about making it tangible and visible. So what, what was what did you the, make tangible? The fact that there was a before and after the digital journey. So just even like the good old mapping and saying, you know, even visually, even in terms of proportions, this is what you're dealing with, but we have this before and this, like 100 meters more um, after the onboarding journey. So just showing visually how relevant that moment uh, was for the customer in terms of time, in terms of um, emotions, etc. So showing it into context really helped them understand, oh, there's more than just the digital touch point. In this case, it was a website. 
Um, so just showing it, even just the visual really helped understanding um, the relationship between that specific moment in the journey and the rest of the journey. And I guess what really helped, again, visually, it was to show the end-to-end, including like handovers, exit points, potential flows, etc. So what happens when you show that? Uh, because, again, these people might, uh, if we talk about the things that they are measured or uh, that their job description says, like they are only focused on a specific part. And then you, you come in as a service designer, you zoom out and you show the entire uh, yeah. process and holistic and then they are mm -hmm, okay but in the end my manager were, just want to wants to see screen so how do you navigate that conversation there were a couple of little things for me it was again language they kept referring to the digital and the analog journey i'm like no we are not looking at the digital and analog journey we are looking at the journey and then in um, within i presented like a life cycle framework so basically showing that the digital and the non-digital journey, they were actually part of the same continuum. And we couldn't just define journeys based on the channel. That was our view, a very silos view. We had to look at the journey from the customer perspective. So there was an onboarding journey that was actually encompassing a number of different channels. So just even changing the language from digital journey to analog journey to there is an onboarding journey, there is an assessment journey, there is an exit journey, helped understanding that we had to look at the product end-to-end -end, um, across different channels. The other thing that really helped is very practical, is actually starting working as a team. So we started having like common stand-ups, the same backlog, even if uh, they were working on the product, I insisted to have to use and um, uh, be in the same uh, channels and rituals, et cetera, that the product team was using. So we were not looking at product versus service, but we were looking at the service at, in, you know, as a team. Was, I'm curious, was there a moment uh, in this project where you felt that they got it? Like, did they see or hear or... When did the when did the lights come on and that they started to care to actually take this into mm. consideration? I wouldn't say there was a haha moment, like mm -hmm. a light bulb moment. It was more, in my opinion, when I started hearing them using a different language, that it made me realize that they got it. So it wasn't something that happened overnight, or there was a like a workshop where we were like, yay. But when uh, the product designer started talking about the service journey rather than the digital and non-digital journey, I think that was, um, for me, a big winning point. Or when, uh, for example, we started uh, incorporating in the testing. So they were testing every week new features or new, uh, new functionalities of the product. We started including some service testing as well. We were testing, for example, scripts for the calls, et cetera. So the fact that they were open to test different parts of the service journey for me was a great win. But I wouldn't say there was a moment where like, oh, yeah, we got it. And, the, and this know? is really important, actually, to pinpoint because um, sometimes it's really hard in service design to see if you're making progress. Like the change can be very gradual, very slow, very under the iceberg kind of thing. Um, but when you see people adopting a service language, when you hear them say things that you mentioned like three weeks ago, you should take note of that and open the champagne on or beer on Friday because that's that's progress. And I think yeah. like it may seem quite insignificant, but that's actually how yeah, how progress is made within service design for a big part. Yeah, our um our uh profession is not a profession that gives us a lot of gratific immediate gratification, I think. We deal with complex, messy, non-sexy kind of challenges, including bringing teams on board, client teams, project teams, you name it. Uh, but yeah, we have to find satisfaction in those little moments where you're like, oh, yes, they're using the right language. Hey, and you have to open a, yeah, a bottle of champagne for those little things. Absolutely.
So yeah, those are small things, but they are not insignificant. And I think it's really hard sometimes to to understand that that's what you should be paying attention to, that fact that language is changing and make note of that. Um, that's really important. Yeah. And um, it's been an ongoing challenge. Uh, as I said, like coming from a service design agency where service design was like celebrated moving into a place where like product was really strong for me. Like one of those winning moments was when after I think 18 months working with the principal product manager, we sat down, we had a client meeting. I remember we were uh, taking the tube back to the office and it was like, Valeria, I have to tell you like, can you tell me what the heck is service design? I was like, come on, mate, we've been working together for 18 months. That's not okay. Uh, so I, you know, I, I articulated it to him and it turned out um, he came up with a better explanation and a better definition than any definition I ever uh, made. And for me, that was a little win where a product person that had very zero, very little, not zero, very little uh, understanding and um, I would say trust in service design was actually able to articulate it better than me. And then he became one of the biggest ab- advocate. So it so took me that, a- 80 months, but so <laughs> I'm, why do you I'm glad think, that happened. Why do you think that um, at some point he became interested in this? Uh, this is a great question because I think what we um, struggle very often as service designer is showing the what, like what is the business of service design. And we focus a lot on the how, and this is an ongoing conversation. I think there was an article from Sarah Drummond a couple of years ago about how suddenly service design is all becoming about process and tools and methods and not about the what, that is the design of services. And I think very often we struggle to articulate that what we do is design services. It's not just, you know, delivering personas or blueprints, et cetera. There was an ongoing job in the office. And I think suddenly for him, seeing firsthand the, um, the impact of the work that we could do or that we were doing just made him click and realize, oh, actually there is value because it kind of, was able to see beyond the blueprints, beyond the journeys, beyond you know those tools that everybody can use, that we were actually adding value to the client. And is that maybe the thing that makes it, that distracts a lot of people, the tools, the so canvases, much. the workshops, like that's the, those are the tangible things, but it, it, so it, much. yeah, it tends to distract from, okay, but, what is it that you actually do? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, it's, uh, it's fundamental. Uh, you know, interrogate, is there a need for this service? How this service needs to be um, designed? Being strategic, thinking about how to connect a service to the business and the capabilities that the business has. So it really connect business and strategy and design rather than just making the ideal user journey, that's not enough. Uh, so it's, it's something that I think it's a common problem for service design and product management as well. Don't, don't even let me start it. If we use a methodology in an academic, dogmatic, kind of like um, checklist kind of way, we, we fail as professional because it's not about the method, it's not about the tool, it's about the impact and the strategic impact that um, you have on the organization and on the service that they're delivering. I, I couldn't agree more. The challenge with that is that that strategic impact is often quite intangible. So it's hard to communicate um, that upfront, like this is the common story when somebody has gone through the service design process, like they get it. But how do you get them to buy in from the start? Because that's, there is a massive. Um, yeah. I think this is a bit of um, the work you're doing, right? Like raising the, the awareness of the practice, how to sell it, how to position it. But also we need a level of maturity coming from other like from our clients and the organization we work with that um, 
is almost like an enabling factor for us to have that kind of impact. Like we need organizations to be more mature when it comes to service thinking, design and product. But we can also help our clients to move and to become more and more um, aware. I think we are really lucky in the UK where we have a brilliant example under our eyes every day that is the government digital services. The, the ripple effect of um, GDS on private and public services has been immense because you're just showing in everyday little things, including, I don't know, renewing your passport, et cetera, how you can really think about end-to-end services, cross-department services. I think that pushed our uh, practice in a, in a place that no one else did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great to have those examples and uh, to have something to point to and, and uh, that gives a lot of credibility and uh, aspiration to the to the field. I, maybe um, uh, you've been dealing with product people for a long time. What is the thing that you th- know now about that um, practice or that field that you wish you maybe knew five years ago and that you would like to share with the rest of the service design community? Yes. Um, well, I already talked about language, you know, finding the, the common language, understand each other's languages. Uh, I already talked about uh, helping organization mature. So establishing the right product and design leaderships. I think those are really, really important. There is another point that I need to mention that is breaking the service design echo chamber. Sometimes we are self-referential. We use our own jargon. We we are uh, we create our own silos within the silos. Uh, but I think for me, the most important thing that I learned in the past few years working with product is that at the end of the day, the design of services cannot exist without a strong focus on implementation. Because um, otherwise, service design is always seen as a strategic thing. But the reality is that we also need to implement. And we suck at it a bit, or we don't have enough good examples, while product managers are amazing. So for me, like what I wish I knew five years ago, it was finding a common language um, earlier on around implementation. So do, really, yeah, do, you, yeah. do you have some examples around that common language for implementation? Because I think I have an idea why we struggle with implementation or what how what implementation looks like in service design but i'm curious what is what is that common language between product and service people and implementation i think we we all want the same thing we just deal with different materials mm-hmm. what i mean with that there is a um, we were talking about this with the team the other week there is a, a, a the material that a product manager has are, you know, backlogs, um, user stories, et cetera. The material that we deal with as service designer are organizations, are people. Uh, Again, immaterial. A fashion designer would have textile and needle and thread. We have organization. And I think uh, people, um, policies, all, you know, messy stuff. So we do struggle with implementation because it's messy, it's complex, it's unsexy. I said it like 300 times now. Uh, But I think we just need to find a way where the way product managers work in implementation, we can adopt it, but we just need to use a different material. So last year, for example, we spent a lot of time as a team uh, trying to upskill or to understand more about operations. And, And what does it take to operationalize a service. Um, Sometimes we are lucky and we can, you know, build a service from scratch. So we can really define the service like the best possible way. Or sometimes we have to deal with what the organization already has. The robotic advice I was talking about earlier, it was quite a good example. We were building a completely new digital product, a completely new um, tech stack. So it was like a new instance, not uh, relying on legacy systems, etc. So the digital team actually had a very fun time building something from scratch. And then when it came to the servicey bits of the of the service journey, we actually had to deal with legacy systems. So 
the legacy call centers, the legacy email system, the legacy CRM. And, you know, we had slightly different pace in terms of implementation because we had to find compromises between this is the ideal experience, but this is the tool that we have. Um, so finding that common language for me was, was all about like similar rhythm, similar tools, backlogs, etc. But then the, 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 the material we use is slightly different, but we need to be able to get our hands dirty as, design, as service designers and, and build the stuff that we design. So, so what did you learn about that uh, operationalizing bit what kind of language, what knowledge that, that is helping you today to actually get services implemented? This is a great question. I wish I had, I had the answer, but we started looking at how we can be um, designing more human-centered organizations. How can we use the typical like, target operating model that consultants are really good at and give it a human-centered twist how do we what, make what sure? What is that target operating model? So it's basically say like to deliver this service for this amount of people, you need these functions, these processes, et cetera. And that's a typical thing that lots of um, consultancies do. By the books, they have their own templates or best practices, and then they just go there and, I don't know, probably it's not that simple. Like they do a little bit of research, et cetera. But I think there is a way that we can do it in a more human-centered way. Uh, we can test target operating models. There are very interesting people in the UK doing that, including Emily Bazalget, for example, that she works in organizational design and service design and testing how um, you can use different operating models to deliver a service. At the end of the day, uh, we need to take in consideration that services are very often delivered by humans and they are a variable that we can't just assume they're gonna work in a certain way. So for example, the last 18 months, I focused a lot on employee experience as well to try to understand, okay, this is the operating model, but what kind of experience uh, do the employee have to, de to deliver a certain service? So I think we just need to be more and more conscious that the backstage is as important, if not more important than the front stage. The front stage is, I'm not saying the easy bit, because it's not, but without a solid backstage, you can't go very far. How do you, um, we, have all, we have a lot of tools, methods in our arsenal, a lot of processes, books have been written, but apparently there are gaps uh, that we're sort of struggling with right now. And we have maybe, and th th this is a classic uh, story in service design, we've been focusing a lot on insights, on research, on ideation. Um, and then everybody comes to the conclusion that the, the hard work yeah. really begins. And this is, I feel also where you're sort of hinting at that, that, that second or third phase of uh, the service design process we need to start tapping in into other fields who have maybe already figured a lot of this uh, out. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's very, very cocky to think that we can sort it out ourselves. I think our role is orchestration, but the capabilities are already existing in some organizations. Sometimes they need just to figure it out, but um, we can't do this alone. And the reason why it's so difficult to deliver services because most of the time it's a it's there is complexity and there are these persistent issues that no one wanted to to to, to resolve and uh, somehow uh, when we start projects that are looking at end-to-end -end services we open the pandora box so there is a level of um leadership that is required, a level of momentum that you need to create. And very often as, an, as a consultant, as an agency, we are not necessarily um, given the mandate to do that. So we need to make sure that we, that we really empower our clients or even better that they can um, create their own internal team and, and push things forward. I remember a poster from, again, GDS, 
from good old Martin Jordan um, that said service design is never finished because that's the reality of things. And here comes again the, um, the similarity with product management. Product managers, they look at the whole life cycle, they keep the product alive, they iterate, they test, they measure constantly. Um, you know, product managers, they just don't deliver a project and go away. They, they keep the, the product uh, alive. So there is so much that we can learn from them on that, on that, on that side. The, the challenge here is that uh, there is a product manager and there is a product, but often there isn't anybody who's responsible for a service. Right? Somebody is responsible for the website, for the app, for the, I don't know, for the social media uh, strategy channel. But rarely yeah. you'll find somebody who's actually responsible for the service. Yeah. And then rarely, that's not there. Yeah, rarely you have like a portfolio manager that perhaps is looking at, you know, a number of products. Some, some, sometimes you have a head of CX that maybe is looking at end-to-end. Um, it's a tricky business and yeah. it goes back to how things are measured, I think, as well. This is something that... Um, Andy Budd from um, ClearLeft, a um, consultancy here based in the UK, um, speaks a lot about the fact that product language is usually more used because product are, uh, organizations are organized around products because then people are measured against certain product KPIs, etc. So it's almost like a chicken and egg situation where Lots of organizations are organized, organized around product because it's easier to measure and faster and easier and more accessible. But on the other side, they are creating islands and silos because that's the way you're organized. So it, I think it's a, like that, there are so many head of design reporting into products, in, into head of product. That's so wrong if you think about it. Yeah, it should be equal. Yeah. yeah. No, but the, yeah. the ROI of design is more difficult to measure right so especially service design yeah well we can make a separate episode uh, on that exactly. and we have a few around uh, around that yeah. now let's um let's use a few minutes to uh see if we can help people who are in a similar position as you've been like okay you enter a new company there's a strong product heritage strong product focus they hire you as the first or second service designer. You come in and you're like, where do I even start? Like, how would you how would you approach this situation with the knowledge you have today? Like, what are some of the first steps you would take and maybe pitfalls yeah. you would avoid? Um, I'm quoting, again, someone else um, and then building on their experience. Um, uh, of Iban uh, Benzal, who is now at WISE and used to be at Babylon. He was the first service designer hired by Babylon Health. And I remember him talking about how at the beginning he was trying to meet everyone and trying to be available for workshops, co-creation. So almost like becoming um, a reference point for everything that is design or collaboration or co-creation. And of course, like, that's not your goal. But that's a way for you to start building bridges and to start building connections. At the end of the day, we are people. We need to create a relationship. So creating those connections, being available, giving a helping hand, uh, you know, get, getting, get your nose stuck in every single situation. I think it, it really helps to make yourself more credible and to create those connections. The second thing is also showing the value. So showing examples raising awareness, showing case studies, etc. Yeah, well, what kind of examples really would you show? What, what have you found that works quite effectively? For me, it's all about showing the impact of the work we've done, not the tools and the methods, as I said before. Like, it's not about... But impact showing... is hard to measure. So what do you show? Yeah, absolutely. But you can show how, for example, uh, you increased, I don't know, customer satisfaction. Like, there are ways to measure... And there are ways to um, show a compelling story. You can test if a service and pilot and measure if a service is 
improved um, or not. It's a tricky business, like I'm not saying, but showing even examples that are not from you, showing like great case study, SDN has plenty, right? So showing other examples where like, you see, this is how a service design line, lens has been applied. Uh, and this is how uh, it was used. This is the impact. Why don't we try it? What do you think uh, this could be? And for me, it's also showing gaps at the moment. So it's really showing, again, bringing the user to the table. I think that always helps. So in that um, RoboAdvice project, what really helped me was to show pitfalls when um, clients were just leaving the service because the transition between channels was awful. No one thought about it. So those were the moments where we went from like 70% engagement to 30. And I'm like, guess why? No one thought about this transition. So almost like making the obvious visible, um, I think that helps a lot. Um, and there is another point that is a little bit more challenging that is showing the risk of oversimplification. Very often, um, you know, the product approach is like, we have this assumption, we build it fast, we, we break it fast, and we, you know, we, we just ship. Some problems cannot be uh, resolved in a fast way. Some problems are complex, systemic, and they need time. Um, so showing the pitfalls of like uh, too fast to be true, so what, what are these pitfalls? Yeah, in my opinion, I was um, yesterday before preparing for, for this um, conversation with you, Mark, I spoke with a colleague of mine that has been working in a um, government project recently. And he really struggled to, he was working in a product team and he was really struggling to trying to solve a ve very complex pro problems. In this case was, helping people retrain when they cannot find a job anymore on the market. Um, so a very complex, wicked, sticky problem and trying to solve it with a product agile sprint kind of way. So going live as soon as possible is not good per se. And assumption-based approach can be too simplistic when it comes to a systemic sticky problem. So in this case, he was really struggling with like, at the beginning, we just decided three potential opportunity areas and then we deep dive into that. But they were like, we could have explored 50 different problems, but we didn't take the time to actually understand which of these problems was actually more um, challenging or worth solving. So sometimes oversimplifying has massive counter effects because once you are in this, delivery mood, you realize, ooh, maybe we should have done that, but we are in now and it's, and it's really hard. So people are com complex, persistent problems are complex. Sometimes it's, um, it's too simplistic to just go in with like, let's build a prototype and see how it goes. Mm. Mm. Yes. Some, sometimes it works. I, I had a project where we didn't have the chance to do initial research. We just went in with some ideas, testing, like a little bit more agile than the typical service design project but when it comes to big societal project uh, no the, the, yeah i think the, tra the trade-off here is how much is at stake like if if yeah. people's lives are literally at stake like you might want to invest a bit more than just a few sprints and have a more yeah. humble and a more thorough approach versus like if you're yeah. a startup and you're Okay, to break things like the reality is that lots of companies nowadays uh, they postpone resolving those problems, private and public, mm. right? They postpone, they postpone, and the the messy problems with time they become messier, <laughs> they become more complex, and suddenly they're like, oh, we we need to resolve it. We have six weeks. Um, can we do three sprints and resolve it? And you're like, certain problems. Um, and there is an amazing talk by Abby Covert from the um, American Information Architecture Institute about how certain persistent problems, they cannot be fi fixed with fast thinking. They need a slow response. I do think that the, re the answer stays in the balance, right? Sometimes as service designer, as we said multiple times, we, 
we struggle to show value, we are, we are slow, we just move fast enough. And on the other side, we have product teams that are like super fast delivering in two weeks. So the, the solution perhaps is in the middle, but um, we can't, you know, certain, certain, even in private sector, like mortgages, insurance, uh, it's so complex that it needs more time than just a couple of sprints. Mm. We're heading towards the end of our conversation. We started with um, the the friction between service language, product language, uh, the the gap between service designers and product managers, uh, how to overcome that, and that product is often in the lead. And if we want to implement and deliver impact, that we need to bridge that gap. How would you summarize this conversation so far? <laughs> Uh, I'm looking at my notes and I'm like, oh, there's so much. Uh, I think, as I said, finding the right compromise and the middle ground, not being dogmatic and being able to adapt the best tool approach mindset to the context. As you said, if people's life is at stake and maybe we need to approach things in a different way. So for me, it's really about framing the problems in the right way and finding together the right um, the right uh, compromise, share the language, share a common language. We all want the best for the user and the employees and the company. And, and last but not least, finding how we can complement each other and how we can really like work together in certain parts or hand over to each other uh, at the right moment and learn from each other as well. So regarding that last thing, how we can complement each other, one final question about that is, what have you heard from product people, and I'm going to generalize here, uh, that they see as added value of people from the service design field? What do they see as the added value from your experience? Um, I don't know if I can generalize. I think it's, it's very it. much, yeah. <laughs> It's very much based on people, uh, but yeah, looking at the holistic end-to-end and looking at the implication of a service, of the impact on the ecosystem, that's something that we can really help product managers to look at. I mean, sometimes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with something uh, <laughs> um, controversial, but, you know, product managers just look at the money and conversion rate while we look at also what is the impact on the wider ecosystem. And ecosystem is you know, the company, the society, the environment, etc. Product managers do as well. But at the end of the day, they have their KPIs they need to eat. Uh, so yeah, as I said, a bit controversial, but we, we really, within the commercial boundaries of companies, they need to make money, of course. But we, we can help them see a little bit beyond what is the product that they're managing. I think Mature product managers, they can do that by themselves, but we can definitely help the majority of product managers to, to do that end-to-end, -to, -end, to look at the end-to-end -end picture. And on that note, I think that's a really good uh, wrap-up and final advice. I think there's a lot of opportunities still. Uh, as, as long as we're uh, eager to learn open and not being dogmatic, like you said, uh, being humble, I think product people are doing also great stuff. So. Uh, Let's, let's learn from that field as well. Yeah, let's find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Exactly. <laughs> well, there you are. I'm uh, going to wish you a very good maternity leave. Hopefully everybody will be happy and healthy in a few weeks uh, time. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing this with the community here. Thank you so much, Mark. And I'm sure, yeah, I'll be somewhere else with my mind in the next few months, but um I'm, I'm, I would be really curious to hear comments and uh, any discussion uh, on product management and service design that this conversation between me and you might spark. Everybody is invited to comment on this. So thanks. Awesome that you made it all the way till the end of this conversation. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to click that subscribe button if you haven't so done already, so you don't miss any future episodes. If you're looking for more, check out the next video that I've got lined up for you. See you over there.